with what they have already suffered, he notes, they would rebel. As the great facilitator he is, God points out that he never intended for Moses to take all of his 4,000 followers, but only about 200 of them, of which one third will be his valiant soldiers and the other two thirds their wives and children. As for the others, God points out that the land of Canaan is a large and luxurious oasis north of the desert of Sinai. And this will serve as a temporary home for those ill inclined or not able to travel for a long distance, a temporary promised land, as it were. God reminds Moses yet again that wherever his children go, there will be danger and suffering. Noblesse oblige, they are the chosen ones, and that's the way it is. It will not be easy to cross the Sinai Desert towards Canaan, and Moses will have to find a second in command to lead them as well. And I will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion, and even upon her assemblies, a cloud of smoke by day and the shining of a burning fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense, says the Lord. Remember, Moses, I shall always be at your side to guide you and our people wherever you shall be. With a great roar, enormous flames envelop the burning bush and cast an eerie light on Moses, who is dripping wet in the supernatural heat. Suddenly, the burning bush disappears. The temperature returns to normal, and the first light of morning appears in the east. God has taken his leave of Moses, and in his place is a heavy stone tablet emblazoned with the Ten Commandments that Moses is to carry down the mount. Moses shivers and looks around, does not see God, and picks up the tablet with a great deal of effort. It is strangely heavy and cold, as if it had never been stuck in the burning bush. It is a blue sapphire stone and numbered with the first ten letters of the Hebrew alphabet, or one to ten in our number system. He studies the engraved text and realizes what he must do. During the next several hours, he makes his way down gingerly to the bottom of the mount with a tablet on his shoulder. The boy was suddenly aware of two old men arguing as they stood at the entrance to the reading room. Look, dimwit, there's going to be a war in the Middle East. Yeah, goddamn nuclear war. It'll never get to that state. It's all threat and bluster. These guys in charge in Iran don't really want war. Bullshit. Nobody wanted the First World War in 1914, but they got it anyway, didn't they? Yeah, but the Israelis aren't stupid. Look, no one's stupid out there, but wars happen. It's human nature. The boy tried to block out the argument, the way he blocked out the traffic noise coming from the street below, but his thoughts wandered back to the argument. If it's nuclear war, the whole, wor whole world will get dragged in. It'll be the end of the human race. We'll be extinct. The boy placed his hands over his ears and rapidly slapped his palms against his ears. The sound they made deadened any exterior noises and voices. He had developed this method from years of trying to read in public libraries. From a distance, he hears his chosen ones making a great deal of noise. He realizes he's been gone a long time, but when he turns around to bend in the trail and trudges down to the hearing below, Moses sees them blasphemously hollering and worshiping a golden calf rather than himself or the Lord, and he is furious. O oh, ye of little faith, how can you forget me as well as the Lord thy God, he roars. With all his might, Moses casts the table, the tablet at the golden calf, breaking the stone in half and the calf to pieces. You do not deserve everything I and the Lord have done for you. We have put so much faith in you, but you have put no trust in us. He scowls with fury and impatience at the weakness of his people. Suddenly, he realizes that they are only mortal like he is. That they make mistakes and that he must trust them just as he is asking them to trust him. However, I am willing to give you another chance. I will leave you yet again to consult with the Lord and hope that you will dispose of this golden calf and repair the tablet. Ponder and reflect upon what I have told you and change your evil ways 
and I will return in seven days and seven nights at the latest, or whenever I will have been able to make contact with the Lord our God. Moses then turns away from his flock of followers and goes back up the hill. Having been so angry with his disciples, he does not stop to bathe or eat, but instead takes to the mountain trail immediately. When he finally arrives several hours later at the clearing, he is delirious with hunger and thirst. And just like before, God appears once again as a burning bush. God first scolds Moses and tells him that he must control himself and be patient with his people. He shouldn't be throwing tablets around just because his children lack faith. They will have to learn to have faith, just as Moses has. Moses should trust in all his children and let them keep the repaired ten tablets, ta repaired ten ta commandments tablets safe. All right. Well, that's the uh, beginning of the first part of the second promised land. I will be reading the second part next time. To read the complete versions of the Second Promised Land and or other works by Richard Bont and other people, please go to richardbont.com and click on Purchase Books Now. This is Richard Bont. So I'd like to thank our guests for being on Curmudgeonly Yours today. And please, if you like what you heard, send me an email to richard at richardbont.com. And if you didn't, please keep your comments to yourself. Remember, this is Richard Bont and curmudgeonly yours on Society Bites Radio, where everything is what it seems, nothing is what it seems, and what is not said is often of most interest. Mm -hmm.